Well, we're hi. so glad we're that so we excited. got you in person. Well, in person, in person, IRL, air quotes. Um, I feel like there's a lot of overlap in the relational conversation mm-hmm. space that we all have. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're excited to kind of dive into it. A lot of people who listen to our podcast, which obviously listen to yours, uh, are really questioning. They're hungry. They're 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 seeking, but they want things to look different, right? Mm-hmm. We're trying to do it differently than the generations before us. Like, I think the conversations around dating now are just different. Mm-hmm. And so I think we're excited to, to dive in there. And you. we find your, you know, straight to the point, so refreshing. We're like, God, you just like, so is it. It's I so- love me a New Yorker. <laughs> I think I appreciate that. Thank you, guys. So, so many people are like, "Where are you from?" I'm like, "Oh, it's not obvious." Like, this? Obvious. I mean, listen, I get, listen. I'm in I'm in LA, and people are always like, "Oh, you're from New York." I'm like, mm, I, did, "I am." How can you tell? <laughs> you're like, is it the cadence, or is it just the fact that I say it to your face and not behind your back? Which one is it, LA? <laughs> That's, right. That's right. The number yeah. of times I'll say to somebody, "I'm I'm not being aggressive. I'm being direct." There's a difference. Um, ooh, I feel that that statement in my bones. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. Somebody was like, you're aggressive. I'm like, passionate. I think you misused the word because if you actually look up what it means, I'm like, that doesn't add up, but it's fine. Yay. We're all in safe company here. <laughs> well, we're so excited. Um, so take us back. Yes. We always start with all of our guests. We always want to know, like, how did we come to be, right? Like, how did you get on this journey? How did this become like your baby? We were talking about this, this being your baby before we jumped baby. on, but yeah. the work that you do, you know, how did you get to be there? Truthfully, I was the girl that needed it the most. Like I mm. first I started like my trajectory was like born in Florida, raised in New York is what I always say, because I moved there when I was 18. So it's like yeah. I spent 12 formative years of becoming an adult in New York, which was yep. so much better than anywhere else. And I worked in fashion like I was I was that girl that was super unhealthy, that was working 20 hours a day, miserable, burnt out, as anxious as they come, narcissistic father, people pleasing mother, like very the recipe for like that just super anxious dater. And it was years of dating in New York, dating the same type of guy until I married my father. Like I literally married, was with somebody that was just like him, treated me like he did. And I genuinely believe that's all I was worth. And when that relationship ended in 2018, like the end of it, I started therapy. That was my first, like, Mm. I was like, something's going on. Like it can't, for me, I was very, no, you guys just don't get me and nobody understands me. And what are you talking about? How can I be the common denominator? I want a relationship. And it's like, no, I was wildly emotionally unavailable. I was so stuck up on this like fantasy. I'm going to be saved in this. And I also realized why I am 34. I started listening to the music that I listened to as a kid. And you're like, oh, oh, <laughs> there it is. There no it is. wonder. No wonder I'm listening to NSYNC saying they'll like go through fire for a woman. And you're like, but this guy's not texting me back. Is that like still the same thing? And so it was just a lot of like personal, like shitty experiences. And I really like, for me, I dove into therapy and I started to discover inner child work just on my own of being like, wow, I feel like a kid all the time. Started to connect Mm -hmm. some dots. And then when I moved to LA in 2021, I was just knocked on my ass of like, hey, okay, you think you're healed? No, go to LA now, try this out. And dating there, and I was pursuing my clothing company software, and I just thought that was my life. I was like, okay, I'm just going to be a business owner of this clothing company. I was doing Shark Tank. I was on set. Like, Sabrina, you're up. T minus two minutes. Like, this is your moment. And then they sent me home saying, I'm so sorry, we can't fit you on. We ran out of time today. And like, I hit rock bottom. Mm -hmm. A month later, my dog got sick. He passed away. Like, everything was ending around me. And I was like, I have no control. The guy I was dating was super avoidant. And I was like, it just, I already knew it was a recipe for disaster. So I let it all burn. And then after Clem's death, like in that time, I started just going to TikTok. And I was like, I can't be the only one that's frustrated in the dating experience Mm -hmm. and hearing things like, if he wanted to, he would. And Mm -hmm. if they like you, you know, if not, you'll be confused. And I was like, those aren't helping us. And those are actually hurting us. Mm -hmm. And I just started to really dive into like, even further, what is the psychology in dating? What's happening in our brain and our nervous system? Where are the connects and disconnects? And it just kind of led me to, okay, I'll start a podcast. Okay, I'll start a channel. And then here we are. (laughs) I love it so much. And I love even just, and I, I think I've seen a TikTok where you talk about this anxious energy in dating a lot of times is about your emotional unavailability. And I'd love for you (laughs) to say some more because I think there's something in, um, I'm consistently with these avoidant people and he's the fuck boy. He's the the problem. Like all of these things. And it's like, yes. And as you just said, 
you are the common denominator in this dynamic, right? Yeah. I love oh. that concept of the unavailability. Not people not realizing like when you're going after the unavailable, many times it's because you're unavailable as well. Yes. I, say more. Say more. <laughs> I like, I would scream this from the rooftops. I yeah. was the girl that I was like, no, play cool. Right. No, no, no. You don't have emotions because like, what did Oof. I learn as a child? Right. I learned as a child, my father being like, when I say narcissist, I'm not just like throwing that term around. It's almost like clinically, you're just like, oh, wow, you have every single check mark. And so to me, what did I learn? Boundaries are not safe. You're not allowed to mm -hmm. say no because you get hit. That was it. We would just yeah. instantly get like punished like severely, or yeah. we'd be left. And he would just leave our family for three weeks if you even opened your mouth and said something to him. Ooh. And then I saw my mother, her dynamic was, okay, we'll do anything he wants. Everybody in the household has to make sure your father is okay. So I grew up being like, I'm always going to be left and everyone's going to abandon me. And uh, So when I dated, it would be one date and I'd be sitting there being like, oh my God, well, he wants to travel. I want to travel. Oh my God, could you imagine? Oh, our kids would look so cute. Like I would create these fantasies and then I would never actually ask any questions of depth. So I thought, mm -hmm. let me use my body. Oh, if I sleep with him, if I play it slow, right. if I play this game, let me move this chess piece to do this. And all I was getting was just consistently people saying, you know, I'm not ready for a relationship or coming on really strong. And so kind of whenever I hear people that really harp on the like, I'm ready for a relationship, no one else is. Yeah. The first thing I have to say is like, cool, what makes you so ready for a relationship? Because if you genuinely are, if you're really intentional with the way that you date and you're like, hey, I know what my non-negotiables are. I know what I need. I'm not willing to settle for anything less than that aspect. And I'm not having unrealistic expectations. Then that just means that when I meet somebody that's not giving me what I want, I'll say, hey, no, thank you. This isn't a reflection right. on me. I just, no, thank you. Instead, what I would do is if you told me on one date that you liked me, I put my worth into that word and I did everything I could to get you to choose me. And then in the end, it was a self-fulfilling prophecy that it wasn't going to work out. And by not taking up space, by not being of saying, hey, this doesn't make me feel good. This makes me anxious. And I start to start to feel scared and I blah, 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 blah. I would just go, well, why isn't he texting me? He's the problem. Why don't you, if he wanted to, he would. I was right. equally as emotionally unavailable because what was I doing? Was I talking about my emotions and feelings? Was I, I was talking about how much I can't stand what you do, but I never yeah. stopped to say I, and that was where I started to see that disconnect of, it's not just that nobody is available because the minute I changed how I dated, once I started to show up and take up space and say like, I, I'm sorry, what do you mean? I can't tell you how I feel like get fucked mm -hmm. then. Yep. I met my partner and the, to this day, everyone that asks him like, why did you guys get together? And he always says, Oh, it's the questions that she asked me on the first date. I knew she was different. I knew she had depth and I knew she was exactly what I was looking for because most women mm -hmm. weren't showing up that way. That's right. Oof. God, she I speaks know. the language. No, I love it. <laughs> I'm like, obsessed um, with you. Sorry. <laughs> what I was just thinking about is how last week I was just doing, I do some like kind of audio coaching, like mm -hmm. I call it coaching on demand. And I was working with this woman and she made a comment about how, um, almost like in passing when she was saying something else around. So she was struggling with this guy that she was dating six weeks. They had been dating. She wasn't sure. I don't know. He's a really nice guy. And then she said this thing about how, um, you know, like he, he can talk about his emotions and he's present and he's able to be there. So I don't know, like, isn't that what I'm looking for? And I came in and I was like, listen, yes, it is. I said, and I said, here's the thing that we all, and I want everybody listening to hear this that's the bare fucking minimum. <laughs> okay. We're not looking at somebody who can talk about their emotions and can show up and be vulnerable as the mm. Holy grail anymore. Okay. And I was like, I literally said to her, cause she was like, my mom keeps saying that there's all these nice guys out there that I keep, you know, brushing off. And I said, I literally said to her with love, I don't fucking care what your mom has to say about dating. I said, we're not listening to that generation anymore when it comes to dating. Damn. And here's, but I think what you're saying, Sabrina, is what I mean by that, which is like, that's the way that we were taught. We, and it's not up, it's, I'm not blaming that generation, right? But like that generation of women, our moms, our grandmas, our, our great grandmas, like it was all about getting a man mm -hmm. because that was safety, right? You couldn't live without one, period. But also that was your worth. Right. So what have we been taught? And that's why I said to her, I was like, listen, with love, stop getting dating advice from your fucking mother. <laughs> like, you're just not, we're not doing it anymore. That is the bare minimum. We're not giving somebody a gold star for being able to talk about their emotions anymore. You guys like bare minimum, you know, I just feel like if we go into it thinking that we're a lot less likely to air quote settle because like, oh, I'm never going to find this again. This person can name their emotions. Yeah. Bravo. <laughs>
<laughs> well, and it's like, or they get like a free pass of like, oh my God, he said he goes to therapy. And you're like, I'm sorry, where are the actions and words aligning though? That's because right. one thing that I always have to point out and like consistency, right? Consistency too. Yeah. And I get, well, but he texts me every day at the same time. And I'm like, that's not being consistent. That's being predictable. Consistency means reliable, Oof. words and actions aligning and yep. dependable. So him texting you every single morning or they, right? You know, it doesn't yep. really matter anymore. Them texting you every single day at 9 a.m. I had a dude text me every single fucking day for like a month and a half at 6 a.m. And then guess who got broken up with after saying, I don't feel a spark. And you're like, it doesn't mean anything. Hmm. And I will say, I am so with you, Vanessa, because I think when we talk about the generationals, right? Like what, what was my mom taught? If your, if your husband's not happy, what are you doing wrong? That's you right. need to make your, good housekeeping. You need to make your husband happy and you need to That's do all right. these nowadays it's almost like i feel like for the last 10 years we started to see women learning like yeah i can have sex like my partner and i fucked on the first date yeah i and here we are no he's rules. literally talking to my mother about rings like please let's let's keep the misogyny yeah. aside and the shame hmm. and it's like sure th back in the day it's like well let's talk about why men had to pay for a woman we didn't have a job we couldn't vote we didn't have and what was the transaction you buy me dinner i fuck you that's like yeah. it's it's been this is nothing new and then all of a sudden, I feel like in the last 10 years, we were empowering women of like, you have your body, you choose it how you want, fuck these rules. And then now all of a sudden, in the last year and a half, I have seen, have you guys seen the sprinkle sprinkle shit? The, you're not a high value woman. You're oh, not a high value woman. My favorite if you term. go <laughs> Right? Because your value comes from, well, you went on a coffee date. You're not a high value woman. I'm like, bitch, I went on a fucking hike date and I had sex with him after and I am getting <laughs> engaged. Like, can we please stop? with these judgments around your value based on what date you choose to go on. Yeah. I'm so, I, you have to tell me more. So wait, just for me and the listeners who don't know what that means. Oof, so what, high value woman what is the sprinkle? Like, what is yeah. the high value? If they don't take you somewhere nice, then you don't have value. I'm so, so old. Like, no, please. What are kids talking about these it? days? I'm with you. I'm with you. Because me, I was like, what is this shit now? So it's like, you guys know, every time you turn on TikTok, it's like cat, black cat golden retriever. And you're like, Jesus Christ. Or a new theory comes out and you're like, that's not, <laughs> let them is not a theory. Let them is just being polite and allowing people to show up authentically as they are. I don't know what's the theory here. Yeah. So to me, what I see, the orange peel theory, and you're like, that's just acts of service. Like, Jesus Christ, <laughs> stop trying to make, I find every, everything Marketing. is identifying. Uh -huh. mm. So the high value woman, the sprinkle sprinkle is this creator. I don't, I don't know anything about her. By no means do I have anything personal against her. Well, a few things. She's, she's, rude. but anyways, <laughs> God, I love she, I take that back. So her whole thing is sprinkle, sprinkle. And she starts saying a high value woman would never go on a coffee date with a man. She demands to be taken. A high value woman will never split dinner. And it's just a lot of shame and judgment. And all I keep thinking is, I'm sorry, wait, wait. Are we, and you, a high value woman looks for a provider mentality. You're too in your masculine. You need to be more feminine. That's why men are turned off by you. I'm sorry, is it 1940 again? Like, what the fuck are we doing here shaming people? Because, so I'm apparently, according to this woman, I am not a high value woman. Because I, as a high value woman, you would never have slept with someone on the first date. You would never allow him to take you for coffee or a hike. You would never go to his house. And I'm like, I don't know, I'm pretty happy. Well, add me to the list. <laughs> I, guess, right? I, I did the same and was married to that person for many years. But I think, you know, what I love about what you were saying about your partner, Sabrina, and I think even as I hear you describing this content, I have a little bit of a visceral response and it's just so much mutual like dehumanization. Yeah. And I love that you're describing your partner as saying like, we actually had a depth filled conversation and she was able to go there. And so often I think there's just such a minimization of the emotional landscape of men. Yeah. And that like, here's what I love about what you do. I think there are a lot of ways that men sort of share with men, like here are the strategies with women to like, you know, Walk do certain down. things. Like if you tell her about your trauma, she's going to feel something and she's going to get this emotional attachment to you. And you're going to get away with a lot of stuff where you can like, breadcrumb her after a certain amount of times and she'll be like really hungry for just that little bit of attention but you sort of bring women in on it it's like this big sister energy of like no here's what's actually going mm -hmm. on here and say the thing and if he doesn't have the capacity for it that's information you know 100 percent. are you guys watching too hot to handle uk 
No. Oh. Should we be? Oh my god. <laughs> and, oh no, I'm sorry. Not too hot to handle. Love is blind. I apologize. Love is blind. UK. Oh. Um, so I love the show because the American version. Oh, it's a hot mess, right? Like these are the traumas. These are the 25 year olds who their prefrontal cortex isn't even fucking fully developed, and they are running around making a mess. But then you go to the UK one. Completely mm-hmm. different experience. These mm-hmm. are pro- most people in their 30s, so it's a totally different environment. And kind of denates what you were talking about. It's that like there's this one guy and he's coming in and he's just saying, you know, uh, he's very, he's very attractive, but love is blind. You can't see each other. And so he's already making comments of how people perceive him as a fuck boy because he's so good looking. And it's like the girl's kind of rolling her eyes and she calls him out and she says, you're not being authentic with me. And he's like, "Ah, I just don't understand. Like, what else do you want from me? And he's, and she even said, she's like, you're telling me everything you think I want to hear. You're using therapy jargon. You're, and I, I was I was snapping all night to this girl. (laughs) Because she is, and and she ends up going for the guy that's so much more authentic. You can see the way he's speaking to her. You feel it. And here's the thing, because I look at this other guy and I'm like, I see how you trick women. I see Mm. how girls could be like, oh my God, but he's so attractive and he's saying he's in therapy and that he realized that like he hasn't been, no, he's full of shit. He knows exactly what you want to hear in order because here's how you'll know it's real. Start questioning it. Oh, really? Okay, so you did to therapy. So what did you discover about yourself when There's you started to challenge those thoughts? Had. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me more about exactly. that. Yeah. Peel the layer back because like That's when I met my partner, oh, we talked religion, we talked race, we talked ethnicities, we talked marriage, we talked kids because I was like, listen, I'm 32 at the time. I don't want to waste my time. If you don't want the same things I do, that's cool. You're great. You're just not for me. That's right. But we're so afraid of not being chosen yep. that we're just like, let me just get in there and try to seal the deal and not say anything that could conceivably make this person reject me. Where what I love about what you're saying is like, reject me and let me reject you. If this is not a good fit. Let's both know that, right? Like, let's be in actual conversation with one another or so and not reject. Obviously, I'm I'd- kidding, but. <laughs> I'd rather be rejected for who I am than being somebody else and didn't even get a chance. But I, what I see so often, and I'm sure, I'm sure you guys see this too, is like every time, like I, anytime I see somebody that says I, I want to be chosen and stuff like that, and when I say, okay, how old is that version of you? Okay, let's bring her or them mm-hmm. in. And then usually when they'll say, you know, like, what is that little you need to hear right now? And they'll say, uh, you're fine. Okay, everything's going to be okay. You're chosen. Okay, what? You, you're you're going to be okay. And I'm like, oh, cool. How validating was that? Like if I said that to you, it was just like, come on, you'll be fine. You, you'll get over it. Because what I see is like, you want someone to choose you so bad, but yet you're not fucking choosing yourself. You're yeah. so terrified of rejection because all you're doing is rejecting yourself. Right. I know it because I did it for years. I thought that I was this princess in a castle and you were going to come and save me. Now, nah, I had to do that myself. I found little me crying in a room and I had to go in and hold her and take her out for the last eight years. And moral of the story being is like, if you don't choose yourself, like my mama, love that woman. All she ever tells me is you got to love yourself more than the need to be loved by other people. Oof. And in dating, oh, wow. it's true. It's like, it's not that you have to love yourself first. It's like, yeah, sure, that would help. But love myself more than the need to be chosen by you. Because if I love myself more, well, then that means I'll, it's like sex in the city when she said, I love you, Richard, but I love me more. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You have great. to. Well, and, and I'm curious to know, like how, as I'm sure you get a lot of these questions, you know, a lot mm-hmm. of times in my practice with clients, um, you know, I'll get the very real, uh, you know, 39 to 45, who's like, um, I really want children. I am really Hmm. like in all honesty, I'm really desperate for partnership because I really want to have children. Right. And, um, you know, I find that it's such a delicate balance between grief, right? Like being in the idea and the felt sense of grief of like, this might not be in the cards for me in this lifetime. Right. And I'm not sugarcoating it for people. I'm like, you'll be okay. You'll find him. Just do all these things and you'll get out there and you'll definitely find the one. It's like, no, I I think that there actually is something powerful in a culture who already doesn't face grief in any way, right. To actually be with yourself in the process of this is a very real reality. What does that bring up for me? Hmm. What are the, you know, the thoughts or like the, I'm not good enough realities that come up like everything inspecting it and then being in that feeling because we can't sit here and promise like, oh yeah, do all these things to yourself, learn to love yourself. And then you're going to find somebody, you know, especially when you have a clock, right? When you're in your thirties, almost right. And you're like, listen, this isn't me being feminist. It's like, no, this is called biology. I cannot produce after a certain time. And like, I had a friend, she's 43 now and she had a one night stand and got knocked up. 
She didn't expect it. She never thought that was going to happen. All she ever wanted was kids. And after we had a talk and she's like, oh, do I keep it? Do I not? This isn't how I thought it was. And I finally had to say, I was like, dude, you got to look at, is it good enough? Right? Like you're Mm -hmm. in, you're at a time where, you know, even like my other friend, she is in her thirties and she's pregnant and she was talking and she said, listen, do I think my husband is the perfect person for me? No. She's like, I'm not stupid enough to think there's no other person on this planet that would be a good match for me. And she's like, but I love my husband. She's like, we've been together for years. But she was like, but the reality is I'm in my thirties and I want children. So she was like, he would be a good partner to do that. And I have to think, okay, well, if I have this ethereal, perfect match that's out there, she's like, well, then I'm gonna have to go find that. I'm gonna spend years doing that as opposed to looking and saying, well, what are my goals? And what, what is going to work for me for now? And it's less about looking at it like settling, but more about like, I'm 34. I know if I were single right now and I really wanted kids, I would have to switch the from the narrative of like, oh, I'm going to get the Ryan Reynolds of the world, these tall, beautiful, amazing men. No, but you know what I might look for? Different characteristics of a partner that satisfy the needs I have now. Like, mm. would they be a good, what, are they paternal? Do they have the one, the desire to have children? Do, could we support a child together? Could we, do we communicate well? Are we able to, because it's just, if you're 39, 40, like you said, I'm not going to promise you the moon, the stars and the sun, but if that's a goal that you have, then I think we need to start adjusting what it is we're looking for, because you're going to have different needs now, if you're looking for a partner to have children with versus just a partner to go on adventures with. You know, it's interesting because I'm wondering about you and what you were describing with your partner, because there's so much about your story that I'm like, oh, I can see the synchronistic unfolding. (laughs) And then you like needed to be this catalyst for women to really see the dynamics and what was playing out a little bit more clearly. And that feels like it was so much a part of your path. And I feel like, I don't know, I just feel so often with clients, there's a very sort of structural, linear, like, you know, problem solution, make this happen. Like, and I work with so many women who like, this is the problem I can't solve to the point, like the career stuff, I've been able to do it, but like, and this, like another person is the variable that I can't control. And I just wonder how much of that comes into play. Like, how do we like a little bit, like, I guess, like you did do your work and surrender and what is meant Mm -hmm. to find you will find you a little bit more, you know? So here's the unsexy part of this part, right? Like, here's the part that we're like, oh, do we have to lift the veil and say it? It's like, yeah, is my partner the dream person that I thought I was going to have in my 20s? Fuck no. Mm. I'm not his either. Like, we have both been very honest of like, physically, he's very attractive. Like, it's not that. But he's not the kind of guy I always went for. I go, if, at nauseum, if you saw a track record of all of them, you'd be like, wow, Sabrina, that's <laughs> impressive. That's impressive that you could find them all to almost look exactly the same and treat you the same way too. <laughs> Um, like if they're not six, four with a six pack and tattoos, I didn't want it. And it wasn't, again, it wasn't that I had to look and be like, ew, I'm settling for my partner. But what I started to realize was I was like, huh, I feel very different with him. I Mm. felt different. He, he loved me in a different way. So it wasn't what I thought it was going to be of, oh, here's that, that path. Ryan Reynolds. I say it all the time because that's my get out of jail free card. Um, (laughs) if he's listening, I love you, but (laughs) It's more about just being able to like surrender to the fact that kind of Vanessa, what you were talking about, like the grief aspect of, I have to mourn the death of the girl that thought she was going to have this life, that she was going to have the super successful and attractive, strong fortune 500 man that was a Christian gray. He ain't real, right? Not for me. But what I learned was, oh, what I wanted wasn't actually what I needed. And once I started to date different types of people that were just outside of my norm, I'm not saying to go for a guy that you're like, I'm grossed out when you look at me, Right. but right. maybe the guy that you're like, I don't feel up or down. I just kind of feel calm with him. Great. Please give him another date. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, and I think what I see so often is people are chasing a feeling. I want to feel a spark. Okay. Well, here's a reality. A spark can't last forever. This isn't Hanukkah, right? It's not a menorah that's going to last for eight days instead of one a day. Like this is real life that the spark is going to dissipate. You're not going to be able to maintain. Like Vanessa, you're married. I'd be curious. Do you always feel this high, high with your husband? Like it would be exhausting. It would be exhausting. It would be exhausting. I wouldn't have time for anything else. (laughs) Right? And I think like that's so often is like, I hear that all the time of, well, I didn't feel the spark with this person. And it's like, well, that's Mm. it. You're you're looking for something that's not sustainable long-term. And then you wonder why you can't find anybody that will go long-term. Well, I love what you're saying. So kind of going back to what we were just talking about with this idea of like women, certain age, wanting kids, all these things. um, 
I think a lot of the conversations I'm having with women in that kind of, um, you know, they're in that mindset or in their age bracket or whatever, what we're saying is you don't just wake up at 43 and say, I'm so desperate to have kids that I'm going to settle for the next man. That's not what we're saying. Mm -hmm. Cause I'll tell you what I see happen a lot. It's the, I actually go out and I find the guy that is so, and I hate this word, but is so toxic for me. And that's the one, because it's the one that gave me the, the feeling or the spark or the anxious avoidant bullshit or all of the things, right? This is the one that I try to lock down because I'm, I'm so I'm in that place of desperation. And then guess what? You brought a human being into this world with this person, right? What you're saying is it's not about settling, but it's about saying if motherhood, if parenthood is really that important to me, can I look at people and say, is this somebody that I would actually be able to parent with mm -hmm. and exactly. say, is this a good parent? Like, are they truly genuinely going to be a good parent? And then maybe that's actually what you pay a little bit more attention to for the sake of that. And I, I'm, I'm like sitting with this idea because it's a little bit different than I think I've ever really thought about it or even talked about it to clients before, but it definitely feels a little bit more I don't know what the word is like empowering or something than going for like the fuck boy that you would always go for and trying to get pregnant because you're so, that's what you want. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. I'm trying to break down here. The other thing, and I don't know if you'd agree with this, Brina, I think your love buds change oh, as you heal. Like so I much. used to be so attracted to that, like fuck boy type, same, like, same. I am desperate for that, like, hi, every time he texts me. All oh, the musicians. I don't That's find that record. attractive anymore because it's like, yeah. it's a little bit like there's not the depth that you're right. talking about. There's not the, but like, yeah, like, yeah. I don't know. I think it's a, it's a both end to me. Yeah, like certainly, sure. yeah, I, I hear attraction in the, the soul of the person that you're in partnership with when you describe it, but yeah. that's very different to me than settling, you know? Anyway. Yeah. hundred percent. It's like, I would never suggest a black, like, listen, I was the bartenders girl. So like you have the musicians, I did the bartenders, right? <laughs> well, I did we those too. A lot of times they were the same. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. hundred percent. They were starving artists. I was about to say the hot. And I thought about the other day. I was like, okay, Sabrina, what made you want the bartender? And it's like, oh, they were the head house, right? They were the good looking guy that uh -huh. everybody wanted in That's the right. room. And you're like, I want that. I want that yeah. one. You guys yeah, and so <laughs> yeah, I used to, I've told Danae and my partner this a million times. I used to like walk into a bar or to a party and literally do the scanning and be like, that's the hottest one. He's the one that's getting mm. like the most attention, whatever. And I'd be like, I'm taking him home tonight. And it would be like something I would almost, it was almost like a self challenge. Right. Now, listen, I get it. Now I realize it was so much about validation. It was so much about being like, I can do this thing. He's going to want me. I'm going to make him want me. Right. Um, I mean, it was fun. <laughs> if I'm being honest, oh. but I know where it comes from. I'm not doing that shit anymore, you know, period. Okay great therapy talk don't get me wrong like oh i i spilled the tea so often with my therapist of like you will never believe this one and it's like oh no she could she could just tell her his career um but it is like also like i think really what we want to look at is because like i i know that when i was in my 20s if i heard this conversation i'd be like oh absolutely not yeah. because you just can't understand then you get in your 30s you're like oh i see what you mean and today to your point as well I became a different version of myself mm -hmm. when I started to heal. And I think where the beauty lies here is like, okay, so you're in your late thirties, early forties. And you're like, Hey, this is my goal. It doesn't mean that you come into the date being like sperm count. Let's go. Right. Like you don't have to come in like a bull in a China shop of like, all right, let's go. What did you, when did you ovulate last? But it's like, but it is important <laughs> to take up space. If you're saying, Hey, mm -hmm. I want to be clear with you. I want to have a kid in the next year. That is my goal. And like my, okay, so my old business partner, uh, when I, my clothing company is called Software. And I started software in 2017 after my mom got sick and it was a whole thing. And my business partner at the time, he was, he was 40, his now, yeah, so they were five year difference. But anyways, he was single and 40. Mm -hmm. And he was very much like, oh, he'll, he'll never listen to this. He was not anything to call home about. Like this wasn't like a male Adonis. <laughs> this was like a, oh, okay. Wow, that's a choice. So, <laughs> but anyways, he, when he really, like he had 40 and all of a sudden, I remember sitting with him and he's like, I want to have a kid. I I'm was ready. like, well, you never said this before. And he was like, I'm ready. Like, I want to do it. Mm -hmm. Dated very shortly, went out with a woman, first date, told her, I want to get married. I want to move here. This is what I want. She was like, me too. Six months later, they're married. Now they have two kids. Yeah. And it's like, and they, and they did all that. And it was like, because 
she and he had the same fucking goals. He even said, he was like, listen, she's not the perfect person in the world. He's like, but she's a great woman and I could really grow a family with her. And mm -hmm. I think we have to let go of that idealization because I get it. I will say his name again. We all want the Ryan Reynolds of the world. Of course I want this gorgeous, like mouthwatering, funny, hilarious, incredible provide. Of course we all want that but it can come in a different package. It doesn't have to come in the six, five gorgeous looking. Maybe he's five, 10, but he treats you like a fucking princess and a queen and you love it and you're fulfilled and your needs are met. That's what matters here. Also, let's be clear. Ryan Reynolds still leaves the seat up on the toilet. He still leaves his socks all over the place. Yeah. He's still right. Like he's a human. He's a human. So I don't care how fucking hot he is move in together. You're still going to, at some point, like that menorah, <laughs> I don't care if it's Ryan Reynolds, you're still not going to spend 40 years with somebody. Sabrina's like, well. <laughs> I was like, I'll overlook it. But no, 100%. Like, I have dated, I've shown friends some of the guys I dated, and they're like, you dated this? And I'm like, oh, they get ugly real fucking quick. Because <laughs> once you peel that off and you're like, uh -huh. did you just yeah. say that to me? Or like, uh -huh. did you just really discredit me? Like, did you just speak to me that way? Is that what mm -hmm. you say to a waiter? Then all of a sudden you're like, I don't care how good looking you are. You have nothing to back it up. Vice versa. Conversely, I've met some people where I'm like, my partner, as he started to talk, his emotional availability, I was like, oh, yeah, okay. yeah, like, uh -huh. yeah, I was like, hence why we slept together. <laughs> like, yeah. I was just like, great. But I think it's really important to know yourself first because I knew myself. I was like, I'm a fickle bitch. I'm hard to love. Like I've got my yeah. stuff. I'm anxious. You know, like I knew me, yeah. but I knew, let me show up like that. And I show up like this so that if you can hang with the ADHD brain, that's all over the place. Great. Good to have you. But I'm not, there was one 90 day fiance show. I'm curious your thoughts on this. And she calls it, she's soft partnering him. Mm, yeah. Taking my first so, half drive. Okay. Wow. So she moved to be with him and she said, and she was like, I'm soft partnering. And the producer said, what does that mean? And she said, well, instead of, cause she's like a very big person, like a bold personality, not in a negative way. She just is. Yeah. And she's like, well, you know, instead right now, what I want to tell him is like, what the fuck are you doing? Da, 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 and go off. And she's like, but instead I just say, okay, sweetie, because I want to soft partner him. And so then she goes out with him and she's talking to him and he's like, wait, 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 you haven't been yourself with me. And she's like explaining the soft partnering. And he's like, well, what do you want to say to me? And then she says, it and he's like, okay, what else don't I know about you? And it's Who like, are you even? I, to me, I was like, yo, soft partnering. Have you guys heard of this? But here's the thing. I haven't heard it called no. soft partnering, but I will say there's something in what you're saying that. I think we as women have to take responsibility for what we do a lot. That's right. Early on, we fall in love with people's potential and we'll oh sort of God. say like, you know, I mean, we could fix this, 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 and this. And then 10 years into a marriage and we work with couples, it becomes, and so did all of this just start? But this was right. the person that he's always been. And I sort of wasn't really thinking about the fact that he didn't know how to talk about his emotional landscape or what it the vision he had of like what a partner should be like I just everything he said exactly like you're describing I was like yes absolutely I'm totally I'm the cool girl I'm down with that I want to be chosen whatever and that like you sort of made that bed sister like that's a little bit yeah. on you you know what I mean yeah. oh a hundred percent I have people attack me all the time like one girl wrote oh wow victim blaming again and I was like no that's it was a limerence me? post and I was like we I said that's the lot. problem yeah, I always said, that's the issue. You perceive yourself as a victim. And mm -hmm. that's the disempowering aspect about it. Because to me, I don't see what is a victim here. How are you a victim? Well, he did this. What's your part? What's your part in it? I am no longer, for a long time, I thought it was a six-year-old left in a room still that I don't have a choice. Oof. You have to come in and tell me that I'm okay. Until I realized, I'm sorry, you're not my mother or father, thank God. You are the schmo I met on Hinge. I do get to make a choice and I do have something to say here. That's okay if you don't like it. I'm cool with that but taking up that space. And I think we do like hundred percent, it's not blaming anybody, but it's taking accountability of what's my part in this. I allowed it. That's right. Yeah. For we whatever the reasons are. <laughs> do you? We get, we yeah. get a lot of pushback too. We get, we hear similar things about victim blaming because I mean, listen, and that's also like, people are going to be in different places in their life. Like if you're not in the stage or in the place where you can really 100% take ownership and accountability, I'm not here to force you also, you know what I mean? I was just talking about this with a group I was leading last night. Like I'm not here. I'm not spending any energy anywhere anymore, whether that's in groups, whether that's with clients, whether that's in my relationship, whether that's with my kid, I'm not forcing no one to do shit except for maybe her brushing her teeth. Other than that, there is nothing that I'm forcing anybody to do anymore. Like 
you're either on board or you're not. Take it or leave it. I don't, I don't care. I don't have an attachment to you taking it. You mm. know what I mean? And I think that I was talking to my group last night about how it's such an empowering place to be when you can transition, transition into the stage personally, where you're like, do you boo? I don't care. It doesn't. And it's not like, I don't care. Like I'm being cold. I just don't care because it doesn't affect and impact my life. I'm good. Right. A hundred percent. Oh, I, I think the, the misconception between taking accountability and blame seems to be where I think there's a disconnect because like, I'll give a very quick example. So I don't know if you guys might know or not, like I had to change the name of my podcast because yeah. I got a cease and desist. Oh, that's so fun to deal with. Right. And d- didn't, didn't see that one coming. And yeah. when it happened, I could have blamed myself and been like, you're a fucking idiot. How could you let this happen? But instead I took accountability and said, okay, Sabrina, you didn't know any better at the time, but yeah, you could have looked into this or you, you, the, the, the easiest decision would have been emailing the fucking lawyer that you had on it, but you didn't know any better. That is me saying, yes, my part in this was, I didn't look into it. I made this, I never thought the show was going to become anything. I threw it out there. It grew. Here we are. Right. And then what I continued of, if I shame and blame myself, then I'll be, woe is me. Oh, he's so mean. This isn't fair. Now, did I believe that a little bit? Of course. You're like, God, what a dick. God damn it. <laughs> you know, because you're a human. But then after, I was like, cool, me complaining about this isn't going to change the fact that I need to take accountability that this is where we are. So let's mm-hmm. be solution oriented. What's in my control? I cannot control that this guy is attacking. I can't control what he's choosing to do. You may, He made it clear what we needed to do. So we said, okay, we're going to do this, that, and the other. There's a difference between if a breakup happens, something doesn't work, you can blame yourself and call yourself. All that mm-hmm. I hear when people blame themselves is two things. One, who's, whose voice is that? Because for me, it's my father. I hear you're a piece of shit. You're a fucking idiot. That's my dad. Second of all, those are my core beliefs. Because if the minute something goes wrong and I instantly go to see I wasn't good enough, I knew this was going to happen. Mm-hmm. Well, then I was a pig putting makeup on, hoping that you were going to be convinced. But here I am. I'm still that. And so I'm hoping that people can learn and hopefully genuinely learn that taking accountability doesn't need to come with shame. It just means that you're saying my part in this, my part in my narcissistic ex was I allowed it. I was unhealthy. I was very used to this and I did not stand up for myself. I'm not blaming myself, but I am saying that was my part in it. Mm -hmm. Oof. I love what you're saying so much because I think we often say like, can I look at the narcissistic ex, which is so often the conversation in the cultural vernacular and say, and what was my part in that? And I think it can feel so unbelievably confronting in situations where there was actual abuse. And I think what you're saying is if I don't really sort of bring the focus back on myself, not who this person was and all of the things that they did that they shouldn't have done, I'm going to be with a narcissistic person again, because again, the common denominator is me in what Mm. I'm attracted to and what I'm choosing and the things that this person said that didn't give me that sort of visceral response of like, what did you say to me? Um, And, and that's my work. That's like for me to get into, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, I, when I broke up with my, well, when the breakup happened, right? Paper, who who needs to know who broke up with who, but I remember doing tapping. And I loved it. I just tapping was super interesting. I don't know if you guys like use that modality, but the therapist I had, we use like meditation and tapping. It was super cool. I really enjoyed it. And I'll never forget. I was gung ho on like, no, he's the pro like, or no, I was gung ho on. It's all my fault. Everything mm. is my fault. I'm the piece of, I'm the worthless one. I am me, 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 me. And it was until I'll never forget. We were tapping and she was repeating what I was saying. And as she, her, as I heard her say, I'm such a piece of shit. Uh, there's mm. everything's wrong with me. And I stopped and I remember just going, well, it can't all be my fault. And that's when she was like, great. And then she started to change the narrative. And I started saying, well, I can't take accountability for that part of it. And it really started to open my eyes of like, whoa, whoa, let's look at this. I don't need to create a narrative around why I did that. I don't need to create of, oh, well, you're a pathetic loser. No, that she doesn't need to be talked to like that anymore. But what I can say is, he reminded me of my father and that was a dynamic I knew really well. And that when he would speak down to me, that's how I perceived myself. So it wasn't anything shocking when he Mm -hmm. would scream at me and walk out of the door. I was that's that's love. Right. But again, it's met with compassion as opposed to it's all them or it's all me. And I'm the victim here. Listen, my father was very abusive to us. Like, thank God he never touched my mother, like very grateful, but we were not given that same courtesy And even my own mother to this day will say, I played a part in this. I did not stand up for you guys. As a wife, I wanted to be chosen. She has her trauma. And she said, I just wanted to keep the peace. I just wanted a happy household. And I just disassociated. Mm. That's okay. She's not blaming herself, but she's understanding 
she played a part in the fact that we have a riff in our relationship because who was there to protect us? I love, I know. And I I think what's really important, and I want to like reiterate this for people listening of what you were just saying, which is it is equally disempowering to either be the one that says it's a hundred percent my fault. I'm a bad person. I did this. I did that. And it's a hundred percent their fault. They're a narcissist. They're a piece of shit, blah, blah, blah. Right. Like what we're saying is neither one of those stances is an empowering stance, Mm. right? Taking ownership does not mean I'm hundred percent at fault. Taking ownership is let me really examine my partner calls it the black box, right? Like what really happened? What really Mm. went down? Let's examine Mm -hmm. the black box. Let's open it up and then start to realize what was my part and then start to this was a conversation in my group last night. I said, what are you holding on to that you need to put down? It's not mm. yours to carry, right? Because that's also a hindrance to your healing. That's a hindrance to your healing just as much as putting it all on the other person. And I think that's a really important like kind of nugget to take away is like they're both a hindrance. You know what I mean? 100%. It's like it's like a, an obsession with people. I can't, when I see this, and I don't know about you guys, I get like a little trigger, you know, a little frustrated of this, like, I can't get over them. It's been eight months and, or it's been two years. It's been five years. They're the one. And it's like, no, dude, listen to what you've convinced yourself of. And Mm -hmm. I get it. I know how scary it is to confront those thoughts because I know for a long time I avoided confronting those thoughts. If I just tried to convince myself that if they changed, then we'd be happy. It was easier than me saying, oh, no, Sabrina, this doesn't satisfy your needs and this person doesn't really actually step up to what it is that you want and I think that you should probably walk away. I get that. It is scary. But God damn it, it's so empowering that when you do, I, I don't know about you, I don't want anyone sleep messing with my sleep. So if I have a human sleeping next to me that is taking away from my eight hours of unencumbered because uh, I have to deal with your <laughs> bullshit, I'd so much rather be alone. Hmm. I mean... <laughs> so much yes but it's been, yeah and I love that you you've been speaking to this thing of limerence and that there's just a way that this becomes like an obsession and like an addiction and I'm literally this is a place that I put this person to like occupy my thoughts to do something and I, I really love that you're speaking to it because like yeah I've been there and mm-hmm. I think until someone like names it in the way that you are it can be really difficult to see this isn't like you know a star-crossed twin flame love affair <laughs> this is like you are in an addictive pattern with this uh, person you know or the, the twin idea of this flames person. oh the twin <laughs> flames oh oh i actually had a client that came to me she studied with them and she was like i spent a hundred thousand dollars for the guy to marry somebody else and i was like oh, oh my god that makes god. my heart Sue them? That's like gut wrenched I I was the same. I was like, unethical pieces of shit, but here we are. Right. But a hundred percent, like, it's just so, I, it's just so, so fucking important for us to be able to take up space. And I know I get how scary it could feel to say that doesn't work for me. Cause I know then you're like, uh, when am I going to meet somebody else? But Mm -hmm. I don't know for me, my mama reframed it. I love this woman. I, even with all this stuff, like again, two conflicting thoughts. My mother could have failed me a lot as a child, but I still love the shit out of her. And she's an amazing mother. Now I'll, I'll back this up. What's a big red flag to me in somebody that claims they're so ready for a relationship is two things. One, not acknowledging that this person doesn't actually work, not being honest about what's the problem. But the second one that's a really big red flag for me as well is the lack of understanding that this might not work, right? Like I think I hear that all the time of like this fear where I'm like, you know that this could end, right? And it's just this like full on panic. And it's like, no, 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 no. My partner and I talk every couple of months of like, are we good or have we reached the end of the road? because I love him, but I'm okay to walk away, right? Like that doesn't have to be. And when we look at that limerent object, right? I'm obsessed with them. I can't get over them. Anytime I've been obsessed with somebody to that point, it's usually because one, if they choose me, I'm validated because look how successful they are. Look how cool they are. If they choose me, then I'm cool. And two, it allows me to avoid what's coming up for me and focus on them because if I get to focus on them, yay, I don't have to look at myself. But if I finally admit to myself, hey, this doesn't really work for me, then I actually have to do something about it. And that oftentimes can feel really scary. Mm. Sabrina, you are just like a treasure for the collective. (laughs) You're just like such a gift. And I think there's a way that you hold all of these really like, kind of like, what did you say before? Not aggressive, but 
I'm being direct. Yeah, these really <laughs> direct truths, but with such compassion. And I mm-hmm. think there's like such an energy of compassion mm-hmm. with the way that you speak to some of these things that can be really confronting to look at. So thank you for that. I just feel like you're doing such a service to us as the female collective. Um, but we have a lightning round of questions that we ask all of our guests. We'd keep you forever, yeah. but let's get into it. Um, so the first question is, who have been your greatest teachers, mentors, people who have impacted your path up to this point definitely my mom um i mean as we can tell um and i would say this is gonna sound so fucking cheesy but like kind of the old versions of me i find Mm -hmm. that like i use those old parts of me to teach how far i've come and to be able to progress because i tried comparing myself to other people and that really didn't work so right now i just compare myself to the past parts of me and so i really try to look at like just people that are normal everyday people like my aunt who had a very abusive piece of shit husband and left her for dead and she got herself up and raised her four kids and like is doing it mm-hmm. so those types of people really inspire me because i've seen what having a caregiver that pays for everything and just takes care of everything the life that you can have but then i've also seen the strength it takes to remove yourself from things like that and that's kind of what fuels me every single day Oof, mm-hmm. girl that, that Oof. part mm-hmm. okay so this idea of flow right? This, this thing that you're doing when time melts away and you, know, you blink your eyes an entire day goes by, um, or an ADHD spot, ADHD speak from one to the other, <laughs> when you get into a hole, right? And you're in like a hyper focus mode. Um, what is that for you? What are you doing when you're in flow? Um, I usually, I loop, I get on like a loop of just like my, my thought, pro- like I'll, well, if I'm working on something, then I'm starting to understand how can I get this done? Like, I'm just on a loop of like, okay, get, just finish this, just finish this. Like Sabrina, focus on this right now, please focus on this. But typically like, especially when I get into, which I don't know if this answers the question, but you could tell me if not. Um, when I get into like my, my, like my loop, I, for me, my loop is very sick, like ruminate. I just, I stay on the same thing and I'll just go over and over and over. And usually what I start to understand is I'll see how many times I've made the same groove and I'll look and I'm like, okay, Sabrina, you've gone over this eight times already. Okay. Now we're at nine. Oh, and Mm -hmm. here we go. We're at 10. And so I really just try to take that awareness of like, so you've looped already 16 times. You're going back in your limbic system. And that just, even the first thing I'm like, we need to do something to go for a walk. I need to do something to move myself. I need to talk Mm -hmm. to somebody. I need to reach out to somebody. I need to understand, do I have control of this or not? And then that helps me make a decision of where I go with that. Because otherwise I'm doing this and then I'm dropping this to do this. And then I'm over here to do this. And I've really had to understand how to really bring my brain back to like, Hey, we need to focus on this. And this is the task at hand. Mm -hmm. And it's really fucking hard. Yeah, it is. Oh, I love that. And what breaks your heart? Oh, so many dogs being hurt is the first that comes to mind, but Mm -hmm. really, I think what genuinely breaks my heart is <laughs> what comes to mind first is the disempowerment I see of so many people and the, the, and the not understanding that as a little kid, I totally understand that you went through all of these experiences and it would make total sense that as an adult, this is where you would go. But it breaks my heart to see that these people don't actually see who they are. They don't see what I see. They don't see what, all, what we see, right? As the collective of you're an incredible, beautiful soul and look at the beauty that you bring to the world, but yet you're just keep putting manure all over that beauty because you want to believe that all you're worth is shit. And it literally breaks my heart when I get these questions of like, how can I prevent self-sabotage? And it's like, Mm. you just, that's not how this works. Or how can I avoid being anxious? And it's like, when you avoid looking at the parts of you that are, then you're only going to keep going through this over and over again. And it breaks my heart to see the struggle and the pain that people have. And my, my mom has always said, just put the backpack down, Sabrina. You don't need to keep carrying it. Mm -hmm. And I just couldn't really fathom understanding that because I was so disconnected between what I think I deserve versus what I actually do. And it was really hard to bridge that gap. Yeah. Mm. All right. Last one. What's your favorite mm-hmm. food? Ooh, anything Asian. I am a slut mm. for spring rolls. Oh. <laughs> and uh, I eat dinner to get to dessert. So I am, I have a cupcake tattoo. Like it's, it's my thing. Oh, uh, like cho- yeah. Chocolate flourless cake. Oh, all day. Um, or like a lava cake. That is my favorite food. Like I love sweets. I love dessert, but I'm very particular. Like, don't give me a fruit dessert, you know, like don't give me an apple pie. I want like the fruit and then that. Uh, so yeah, Asian food or dessert. So all right, all like right. you're the, a blend of the two of the us. The dessert so is married today. Be like, oh, there it is. Like, oh. And Vanessa's like, yeah, the Chinese food. Um, you are such an incredible, beautiful soul. Sabrina, thank you. I just, 
I I think you're a delight. <laughs> and this was, and I'm like, I, I want to keep her. Maybe. maybe because you remind me so much of Vanessa. <laughs> What's well, so funny, Thank Vanessa, I cannot you. tell you. Danae, people have always told me that you and I need to have a conversation, but people were like, you and Vanessa are so oh. alike. And I was like, <laughs> fuck really yeah. Are. So, yes. And I know, Danae, we're going to have you on the show. And Vanessa, I need to schedule you on the show so that we Let's can come it. and have this full loop so that we can have even more conversations. Because guys, all I'm trying to do is highlight the work that you're doing. I am not a therapist. I don't try to pretend to be one. I am not trying to under, well, please, I don't want to be. But what I am trying to do is to, um, to show people that like what you guys are saying is very fucking real. Mm -hmm. And just please listen, because this is what happens if you do. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, guys.